I've done that already, yeah. I, but I do apologise. Sorry. No problem. Chris. Thank you, Ben. Um, morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, f first of all, um, Mark, you said that you thought self-driving vehicles would be safer. Um, what evidence have you got to support that uh, statement? So I think we've seen um, some innovations where we're getting more assisted driving systems that are um, reducing collisions. So one example is automated emergency braking, where there is some quite good data. Uh, so, so this is a system where actually, rather than you reacting and braking, it, it, it spots something in the road ahead and the, and the brakes happen automatically. So there's some quite good data emerging and showing that that um, is reducing the chances of collisions. And that's primarily because the system is able to react quicker than, than a human can react. And so um, I think as technologies like that develop and as uh, collision avoidance systems become more sophisticated, mm -hmm. that that will in general the overall, help. The overall safety suite of systems and so on is not really adequately advanced for you to be able to conclude at the moment that those vehicles will be safer than manually driven vehicles though. So I think there's, there's, that's quite a complex issue to actually unpick. So I think at the moment we have a very complex collective of vehicles yeah. on our roads and that potentially will just get more and more complex as more um, developed systems come into play. So what I would point to and what our concerns would be would be in particular around consumer education of what their vehicle system can actually do. I understand the concern. Sorry, just wanted to keep it yeah. short and sharp sure. on, the, on the safety point about the evidence of, of your, to back up your statement and say they would be safer. That at the moment, uh, it feels to me we might not have all the evidence that's right. available to support that statement. So I just wanted to um, clear that up. Um, I just wanted to move on a little bit to regulatory frameworks, if I may. Um, ben, I'll start with you and then Mark, I'll come to you uh, secondly. Um, how does the government propose that the regulatory um, environment should change? Well, the government has actually done some excellent work, uh, which was published over the summer. Uh, there's a document which is called Connected and Automated Mobility 2025, which sets out the government's vision for what the, f what the kind of regulatory framework should look like uh, through to, to, to kind of that deadline. Um, it essentially recommends um, or endorses a number of the Law Commission's recommendations from its three-year review. It includes the introduction of new legal actors, the ASD, the NUIC, the UIC, um, new regulators for approval, in-use and accident investigation, uh, data disclosure. Um, so there's some really good work that's been undertaken and there is a solid blueprint out in circulation. Um, I think that the key question is how can we bring that to life and how can we bring that to life quickly? Yeah. Um, that is the, the, the kind of key question from my perspective. And how will it change the legal role of manufacturers and software developers, do you think? Um, well, it will probably create additional liability for them. Um, at the moment, kind of circa 95% of road accidents are caused by human error. So if we take the human out of the equation and there's still accidents, that's probably going to land on the, the car manufacturer or the software developer that's putting the self-driving system onto the market. And then, you, in your opinion, this is probably more of a question for Mark, but I'd ask, be interested in your opinion. Um, given that sort of rebalancing or reprofiling of risk away from the driver, do you think that's likely to have a positive effect on insurance costs for the driver? Um, the the answer is potentially. Uh, I agree it's more a question for Mark. I think one point is that with these vehicles having lots of sensors and expensive bits of equipment in them, if they're involved in an accident, the cost of repair is probably going to be a lot more because they're a much higher value uh, piece of equipment. So w will it have an impact on premiums and bring them down? Possibly, uh, particularly over the long term, but in the short term, think yeah I'd have to hand over to Mark on that. Mark what do you think about that? Is, is car insurance going to be cheaper for people if they have self-driving vehicles because the risk profiles we've just articulated may go much more towards software developers and the manufacturers? So it, it depends is the answer. I think what we need to realise is that with many of these new technologies are actually dependent still on human behaviour and human understanding of what the vehicle's capabilities are. 
and I think a real concern for us is that there is a potential misunderstanding. So Thatcham, who we worked very closely with recently, did some research that showed that over 50% of, of consumers think that there are fully autonomous vehicles out there that they can buy. Um, so when you hear terminology like autopilot or driver assist or, or the various different terminologies that are out there, to me that suggests that many consumers would think they can take their eyes off the road, they can take their hands off the steering wheel, they don't need to go back and charge at a moment's notice. But there's a big difference between the technology that we have that really will require user in charge systems with no user in charge systems of the do you future. Think, do you think the term self-driving vehicle is maybe the wrong one? So, I, I, I'm not going to argue with this because I think we've got a settled position on I mean, that with, with, they're not self -driving uh, with the government. That's what you're saying from the insurance but perspective. We would, we would certainly differ between what we would determine to be assisted driving systems and automated driving systems. And if, I mean, I'm not getting from you at the moment that there is any clear shift in responsibility away, insurance responsibility away from the driver. Um, is, is there not a risk that actually there is a, an increase in risk to the driver in this case if they don't have full control of the vehicle because of its automated uh, automated capabilities? There might well be, and I think, again, I'll say it again, it comes down to consumer education because I think that is the real risk that people un overestimate what the capabilities are of, of their vehicles and they presume that it can self-drive, that it can react to various scenarios in, on the road that may not be part of, of the specific so domain given, dimension or whatever so it happens to be. So the insurance industry, I'm assuming, will at the beginning assume that if it's, a, if it's all brand new, um, you're not going to have a well-educated ed population and therefore the insurance risk will, be, will likely be higher well, and therefore an associated premium that goes with it. As, as a... As someone in the insurance industry, I can tell you that insurers don't usually like to make assumptions on anything. So they would generally wait for data to underpin um, what what that shows. So if 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 over time we're actually seeing data that certain uh, technologies are reducing collisions and are less costly to insurers, then we would expect that to feed through and be impacted on premiums. But ben, Ben's right. There, so there are, there are there are two kind of drivers to, yeah. to this. One is a potential benefit and reduction uh, that would come from reduced collisions, reduced personal injury, reduced bodily injury costs if you have fewer collisions. But generally these are going to be more expensive vehicles to repair. So that is the, the kind of push up on, on costs that will, that will often come with this. Thank you. Um, Ashley, do you have anything you'd like